what's up? Welcome to another episode of your favorite jiu-jitsu podcast. It is a fistful of collars for Rapid Studio here in Austin, Texas. As ever, it is myself, Howell Teague, Chase Smith, Reed Connell, and Will Safford here to talk about the biggest jiu-jitsu news from the world of grappling. And man, there is some big news going on in the community at the moment, right? It's been an interesting couple of weeks. Busy period, shall we say. It's definitely, yeah, it's definitely some, uh, some big news last week, right? That... Um that definitely shook the jiu-jitsu world a little bit, it seemed like anyway, on, on our social channels, right? Everybody talking about Paolo Miao? Is that what you're hinting at? Yeah, Being yeah, so coy over there. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to give it away right away, you know? So. No, no, you teased it, and you're definitely right. Everybody's been talking about Paolo Miao. Let's, uh, and we're going to get into that today, because I think there's a lot to unpack about that particular story. Totally right agree. Here, a, lot right? of, a lot of things people don't understand, I think. So I think there's a good opportunity to, to really lay out exactly what happened. and Because mm-hmm. it's been a, a long time coming, too. It's been the thing that happened two years ago, so... A lot, lot to unpack. And there's a lot of, uh, shall we say, like you said, maybe people don't really understand the situation correctly. So let's get into that. But, man, it is a busy period. September seems to be a stacked month for us. We've had a ton of live events. We've got a bunch coming up real quick. Uh, this weekend, so you can probably tell by my sweater, for those of you who can see, New York, New York. Mm. It is the Nogi Pans this weekend. So we're going to be hitting up IBJJF Nogi Pans. And well, I don't know about you guys, but this seems to be the hottest and the most intriguing Nogi Pans probably for the last couple of years. Man, I'm super hyped for this event. There's yeah. going to be the most names, the, the most stacked black belt divisions, uh, at least in the last two years. And uh, One name, though. One name one really name. jumps out. you got to wonder, is it the Gordon Ryan effect? Did he really <laughs> just sort of catapult this into a, a new dimension? What do you guys think? Well, one thing about Gordon is you know that whenever he puts his name into something, of course, it's going to get a lot of attention, right? So there's definitely that. But uh, he's, of course, not the, the only athlete I'm paying attention to this weekend. I'm always looking forward to seeing Jackson Souza compete. Uh, and he's going for a three-peat here. He's won gold every year since 2014. I like that word, three-peat. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> rolls off the tongue nicely, <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. Did, uh, you, can, uh, did you come up with that? You can write that down if you want. <laughs> um, Joao, Joao Miao going for the five-peat, That's though, true. Right? That, that's Dang. a little bit, that doesn't that's a bit clunkier. <laughs> that's a bit clunkier <laughs> over there. I don't know. <laughs> so, but this is our this is our third year streaming um, Nogi Pants. No, fourth. This is our fourth technically, year because we've done it every wow. year since 2015. Wow, 15, so, 16, 17, 18. So this will be the fourth. It, it's year, true. Right? It, it does seem like it is a, a good progression, right? It, like um, you said, this year it seems like it's just so so huge. Maybe because Gordon Ryan, but it does also because seem like it's a natural progression every year. It seems like the tournament's gotten a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. Oh, 100%. The, the teams in New York, right, are getting a little bit bigger, a little bit uh, more competitive and things, more teams and stuff. So. I remember. When it used to be just a one-day event. It's mm-hmm. two days now. So it's obviously it's growing, you know, the growth of jujitsu. And you know, I'd like to think that we play a small part in helping, you sure. know, spread that message right there. But yeah, there's some really good names signed up because the divisions, you've been to this event too, Chase, right? The yes. divisions, they always used to be a little bit smaller than there was like one elite guy, one one or two per division, yeah. and then a lot of local uh, East Coast athletes. But this year we're seeing three to four or five big names in each division. Um, you know, I, I just put out today's article, Six Dream Matches We Want to See. Uh, I'm particularly excited about the potential matchup of Dante Leon and Enrico Coco. Nice. Two guys Ooh, that are super, uh, I say, contrasting styles. You know, it's kind of a, a tried and true, maybe overused phrase, styles make fights. But those two guys couldn't be more opposite, I think. And uh, I'd Enrico Coco, is, he's, he's really into the heel hooks, right? He's... He is. So it's a little bit of a, he can't reap, he can't use his heel hooks, obviously, but... He's also got like a great uh, headlock sequence mm. and just like dynamic passing. And mostly what he does that I think is sort of maybe intangible in some ways is he redirects energy really well. He's kind of slinky. He's, he's, he's like slick. water. And Dante is just like, on the other hand, a powerhouse <laughs> beast. So That's actually a really good breakdown of Enrico's style. He does have a very fluid style of jiu-jitsu, mm. right? He's a good wrestler, too. He is. Now, you guys hit, his, uh, hit up his gym in Florida Zen uh, Jiu-Jitsu. a while back. Uh, that's an appropriate name for Enrico, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's been Zen Jiu-Jitsu. I think his family has owned it for a long time, too. So yeah, yeah. He shares a space with them. They have a, a Taekwondo school. That's how he got into martial arts. Um, Lifelong martial artist. Yeah, and actually, I, I just learned this the other day that he he met Wagner Hosha, and that's how he got the fight sports connection in, like, 2011, I want to say. It, it's not, Fairly recent? Fairly, not recent, mm. but, like, he didn't come up under yeah, Cyborg. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was already established and fighting black belts at that time. That's interesting. And so. you, to be honest, you couldn't get two contrasting styles more yeah, yeah. than Wagner and Enrico. <laughs> right? Enrico takes what comes, and Wagner, like, They could like, do, like, a buddy cop you. thing, though. They could do a, some sort of buddy <laughs> cop show. Or, I, I could see it. I'd Good cop, that. bad cop. I, that's, like, a perfect <laughs> thing for them, They're I think. Trying to track down AJ Agha's arm. Is that the... <laughs> 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 the Florida boys on the loose. <laughs> 
Man, uh, I hope the guy who makes Don Janaher uh, does a, a fake trailer for that. Oh Enrico and Wagner rolling around after like AJ Eggers. Smash up Shout out to uh, Don Janaher, yeah. by the way. Freaking unsung <laughs> hero of the Instagram jiu-jitsu community. But uh, <laughs> Chase, you also put out a highlight yesterday of uh, Jeremiah Vance. And that, yeah. man, we got a ton of comments on that. That guy is a finisher, and when he finishes you, it looks painful. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look fun. He's a guy that I, I love, actually, because he doesn't, demand attention at all he just does this crazy shit for almost like three years and you can't deny him anymore he's highlight level he's black belt level and uh um, his black belt this year right this mm-hmm. year i think i want to say american nationals might have been his debut maybe he did some regional event that i didn't see but um he did quite well in american nationals i think he hit a buggy choke there or a bunny choke some some crazy thing so it's like, it's some crazy weird, choke. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's like it's like a weird like from underneath bottom side control mm-hmm. like a, a weird rubber guard style reverse triangle thing and he put the guy to sleep. He goes right, right to it, too. He's looking for it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very relaxed, very smooth. So but I love the next generation of 10th Planet that we're seeing come out you mm-hmm. know, recently. Uh, PJ Barch looked great. Um, another guy, Cre- Keith Gregorian, I believe is how you say his name. And uh, Jeremiah Vance. Like we, Everybody knows about Geo and Boogie and everything like that. But there really is like this new wave of mm-hmm. 10th Planet guys that I think that are making a, lo- a lot of noise and are super exciting grapplers. You know what I like as well is the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of the talk about 10th Planet style is uh, the Smishnoni and, you know, they're really about that movement, embracing the leg lock system and stuff. But a lot of them now are going out and they're hitting up these IBJJF tournaments as well because they understand it's a great place to make your name. Mm-hmm. It's a great place to go out there and test the skills because there's a lot more to jujitsu than just twisting leg locks, right? So I kind of like the fact that you've got maybe a, a, a kind of a contingent of the 10th Planet schools that they will go up and hit up these tournaments in search of gold. That's really cool for me. Yeah, I think a lot of those guys, a lot of the subordinate guys, I was talking to Ethan Cranlinston there about a couple weeks ago. Who's also at Nogi Pans. Also at Nogi Pans. And, and, you know, sometimes he was having trouble getting matches. You know, he's having trouble getting tough matches. And where can you go to get tough matches? Open events. IBJJF tournaments. That, like, you were guaranteed to get tough matches at an IBJJF tournament. So he was like, yeah, yeah. man. So he's like... I got to go to those tournaments because that's where I'm going to get my, my toughest magic because he was t- having trouble booking big super fights or, or you know. Um, Man, you can't those get a things. match every weekend, you know. They're like the sub-only scene, is uh, exactly. it's, it's vibrant and it's thriving, but it's still a niche within jiu-jitsu. Mm. And there aren't that many guys out there, uh, you know, operating at that kind of level. So if you're a high-level submission-only guy, let's say like an Ethan or, or you know some of these 10th Planet guys, and you're looking for those matches, you're going to be ended up going up against the same guys over and over because mm-hmm. there's a very limited pool of people to draw upon. But like Ethan's jumped into the brown belt featherweight division here at Nogi Pants, and there's 16 guys, and he's got guys in his division like... Um, you know, like Malachi Edmund from Team Lloyd Irvin, mm-hmm. uh, Juni Ocasio from Unity, Thiago Abuj from Unity. These are some really solid names, you know? So, No, I give a lot of respect to the guys who, who put their hat in for, you know, IBJJF and sub only. So, for example, Gordon, right? He's This is not his wheelhouse. He's a sub only guy. But he's out there, you know? I think it kind of shows that, like, he's willing to explore. He's not hiding behind a rule set. And, uh, you know, it just makes someone, like, more well-rounded overall. So, Man, a really interesting statistic. I thought this was fantastic. We, uh, we highlighted this in our Nogi Pants preview about Gordon, right? Of course, you think of Gordon, you think of Dan Hadesquad. Squad. You think of Dan Hadesquad, Squad, you think of Leg Locks, okay? But in the last year, calendar year, right, going back to September of 2017, when Gordon won the ADCC 88-kilo championship and then took silver in the absolute, he submitted Keenan Cornelius... Homolo Bahal, Yuri Samoyes, and Craig Jones, all of those with IBJJF legal techniques. There it is. Just that, 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 that point list point of competitors right? alone is insane. But to do that without his bread and butter, you know, leg lock game, that's even crazier. I feel yeah. like he's just playing whack a mole with the doubters. Like, all right, I'll do an IBJJF event. Like, what else can I do? Hands by, tied behind my back. I mean, like, <laughs> no, yeah, I, yeah. Right, I remember when he fought um, Joe Bays at uh, Submission that's Underground. That's right. He, he right? purposely yeah, yeah. didn't do he, leg lock. Yeah, yeah. exactly. He, he said that because Joe Bays is known as a leg locker, and it seemed like at that point Gordon was getting a lot of heat for only being leg locker. So he said that he really wanted to prove a point and, and submit Joe Bays without a leg lock, and he did. Yeah. Took his back, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the things with Gary. You know, Gary was always game. You know, he was, came out in the gi, no gi, IBJJF, didn't matter. He was down for anything. And, like, how awesome is Gary? Everyone loves Gary. So well, Gary came to yeah. leg locks very late, too. Or, or not too, but yeah, he, he it's didn't, true. A black belt. Yeah, he didn't start doing leg locks until he was a black belt. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, it's a bigger question, isn't it? It's a bigger discussion, I should say. It's about that whole style versus style thing. If you want to be a top jujitsu guy in the world, you've got to be prepared to do a bit of everything. Whether mm -hmm. it's gi, no gi, whether it's submission only, whether it's points, whether it's ADCC rules, IBJJF. And, you know, there are people who have made their names in one specific area, but the best guys in the world competed regardless. You know, when you think of goats, you think of IBJJF champions and ADCC champions. Like, it's absolutely true. But they've all dabbled. You know, we've sure. seen guys like Bouchesha and Roger Gracie in submission only matches. We've seen them win in points matches. You know, even going way back to guys like Marcelo Garcia, won ton of points tournaments. He also competed submission only, like way back in the day. Mm -hmm. it ex you know, it was out there. It was a thing. So. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that, you know, if you if you want to really go out there, you know, you can't limit yourself to one style and call yourself the king of that. You know, you have to be able to branch out, right? So Yeah, it reminded me of that or what a good match the um Johnny Grippo, John Callistine match was oh, yeah. there. You know, it's kind of exactly what we're talking about, those two different worlds colliding. Johnny being the points guy and, and John Callistine being the uh the sub, the sub only guy, yeah. yeah. That was a pretty good match, though, right? It was yeah. fun. It was, that, was a, that was a good one. It, Johnny, Johnny was working his ass yeah, off. Yeah, Johnny was just attacking, <laughs> attacking, attacking. Man, good. John said to me that earlier this year when we interviewed him, though, that he's had the same position, that he's struggling to find matches. Because, exactly. you know, he's so good at sub only, not that many guys want to go up against him. So, but he's in a position now where he's like, actually, I want to do points tournaments because mm. I want to prove to people, hey, I'm not just some mm -hmm. sub only dude. So... So I think, man, if we just keep mentioning it, but ADCC trials this year are going to be fire, right? Because there's going to be so many guys coming through to try and get into Worlds next year. Yeah, can't wait. Oof. Can't wait for those to begin. All of them, I think, are going to be stacked. Every every trial is going to be crazy stacked. First event, uh, October 6th or 7th in Romania, the European trials. I'll be out there, and I can't wait to both <laughs> go to Romania and, and see the first event. And really, uh, man, it's going to be a huge honor for, for us to, to cover the whole series of trials events going up into into worlds i mean road it's to adcc be, baby can't wait to you see know, it play out really cool is um guys like nikki ryan and mike perez who made it to adcc as purple belts they kind of like opened the you know paved the way for guys who are not black belts and said hey you know if if you're training hard and you know you think you compete you know get out there try these trials so I, that's why i think this particular <laughs> trials we're going to see so many good names purple brown black belts it's going to be competitive. People we've never heard of, probably. Uh -huh. you know, yeah, some, some scary wrestlers. wrestlers coming out of the woodwork. You yeah, you, know. you always get some real wild cards coming in via these trials events, just coming out of nowhere. Yeah, John Salter right? coming out and like beating yeah. DJ Jackson and Josh Hinger to win trials is Man, crazy. I, I was thinking about this the other day, actually, because I was thinking about how ADCC always made a point of calling themselves submission fighting. Mm. Not submission grappling, submission fighting. Mm. And in the early days, and uh, you know, they very much kind of played on the style versus style thing, because, you know, ADC's been, ADCC has been around since the late 90s, right? And that was the era when MMA didn't, it wasn't really called MMA still. You know, it was still like no holds barred. Yeah, and it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was like a wrestler against a jujitsu guy and then a Muay Thai guy against a, a karate guy. And it was a lot of that style versus style. And ADCC was a similar vein and they had judo versus wrestling, wrestling versus jujitsu. And um, they brought a lot of MMA guys in as mm -hmm. well. Tito Ortiz, Always. Jeremy Horn, Matt Hughes, Mar Mark Kerr, you know, all these massive names from that kind of like that, that 20 years ago era of MMA, they were all competing at ADCC. And I was wondering, will we see any high level MMA guys come into ADCC next year? You always get one or two, right? Well, yeah, the we undefeated Benson. Chael Sonnen might return. So <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, We had Benson Henderson mm -hmm. in 2015, right? Um, oh, he's done it a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah. Maybe 2013 yeah, as well. Too, what, yeah. what about what about Conor McGregor? <laughs> <laughs> I think we can dream. <laughs> That'd be sweet. No, yeah, but it seems like, right, because it used to be ADCC was kind of like the, the launching place for an MMA career a lot of times, you know, especially those early in the 90s and early 2000s and stuff. Not, not so much the case anymore. It seems kind of, there's kind of like a... I don't know, different way that people are making a name for themselves in MMA. I don't know, so. actually, up until relatively recently, that did happen. 2015, yeah. I mean, it's Adolfo won ADCC and then immediately signed an MMA That's contract. Mm. Basically, he was scouted at that event. I remember there was some, like, there was a Japanese dude kind of floating around inside the arena, mm -hmm. and somebody kind of, you know, whispered to me, they were like, hey, see that guy? He's basically here to sign 
MMA guys or to sign guys to an MMA contract, I could say. And, and Gabby Garcia and Hadolfo both signed contracts after that weekend. Was yeah, Gilbert Burns go. in a similar position? Because I, I know he medaled at ADCC. I don't think he I don't think he took first. But then shortly after that, he went into MMA. I think he's as well. a bronze medalist at ADCC, but he's won no gi worlds more than once. There are a bunch of guys who dabble, right? I mean, Davi Hamas has got like about yeah. six, seven MMA fights, I believe. He's an ADCC champion. So there's definitely guys who kind of, you know, are in both worlds, like a foot in both. Jake but Shields. Jake Shields, a great example. But I, I'm wondering, will they pull any kind of like guys you don't necessarily Current fighters? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Any, yeah. any MMA guys, you don't really think of them as like, a, oh, he is like a part of the grappling community, but he comes in. And That's what I was. I was, I was trying to make a point of like, um, like the MMA world seems different now. It's like less about like going to and like, I don't know, prestige and more about like making some money. Yeah, or yeah, exactly. <laughs> like like, like, like talking talk a big game, right? Like yeah. that's the way to, to make more, I mean, more money. You know, I don't know if I don't follow MMA as much as I used to. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but you know, I know you guys are fans. Tell me what you think. But when I look at MMA nowadays as well, I don't see that many people flying the flag for jujitsu. And I'm not that many. I'm not sure that there'd be that many high-level MMA guys who would be like, you know what? I want to come back and I want to show what I got and show my jiu-jitsu. Am I right or am I wrong? Kind of see that too. I mean, it's it's so like you know to be a, a good martial artist now, you have to be so well-rounded. So I don't know if people are not pursuing one martial art for a longer period of time like they used to, and then adding other things to their kind of skill set, or yeah, they're just point. you know they're MMA fighters. They do everything. Mm. But I, I noticed that as well. What do, you, what do you think? I think, uh, I mean, there are certainly guys that fly the flag. I, I think you have Gilbert Burns, we mentioned earlier, Dylan Danis, of course, and Rafael Lovato. There are plenty of guys that are, are great. Um, but I think I think it's been shown that a little bit of jiu-jitsu can stop a lot of jiu-jitsu. And so MMA fighters, they, they learn the basics. They know how to avoid some submissions. And there's so much they can do in an MMA format that just negates jiu-jitsu mm. that it makes more sense to, to just not be a specialist, I think, at this point. Yeah, you have a couple of other guys, Ryan Hall and Mackenzie Dern, of course, probably the best jiu-jitsu in MMA out there. You know, and she, she... Ryan's been pretty uh, vocal in his uh, disdain for jiu-jitsu in general, though, right? Competition, not... right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of falling out of love with it, which is a shame, because I'd love to see him back. Oh, absolutely, yeah. He would be perfect. Um, but I don't know. It's an interesting question, but I, I, I would... I would really hope that there would be some guys to uh, for in, in the MMA world. You know, it sounded like Kevin Lee wanted to get back mm. into into the jiu jitsu right. world. And, you know, it sounds like some guys are are definitely teasing super fights and, and teasing that they'd be interested in grappling certain people and stuff like that. So I I do hope to see some uh, MMA guys. Maybe Tyrone Woodley will break in his new uh, his new belt, his new black belt. Man, he looks so happy with that, right? I think he, he got like the UFC belt tied around his waist again, and he's just gonna whatever, you know, job done. Gets the black belt thrown at him, and he's like, wow. Yeah, he's stoked. <laughs> That's cool. That's a cool moment for sure. That was really nice. Yeah. So, uh, moving on, we got a um, another big event I just want to talk about real quick, actually, and that is the King of Mats. That's coming mm. up. Um, this is the day after the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam. Grand Slam takes place in Los Angeles on September 22nd. And then on September 23rd, we're going to have the King of Mats. Now, King of Mats is coming back. The, uh, we saw the uh, inaugural event uh, take place in Abu Dhabi this year at the World Pro, right? Well, we were there. Yep. What did you think? I thought it was awesome. Um, it was it was fast. You know, it's a really fast moving event, and it's round robin, so you get to see these outstanding names. Everyone go against each other, uh, and quickly too. You know, there's no stalling or there's no riding out matches. It's six minutes. Boom, the next one's up. Um, and we got to see, in that one, we got to see lightweight and middleweight, and then this one's going to be the heavyweight. So. Actually, they had heavyweight in, in, in Abu Dhabi too, right? They had light, middle, and heavy. Oh, wow, right. Yeah, because remember, like, Trans won. He right, fought right. Cyborg. Trans basically won it with one leg. Because <laughs> uh, you got meniscus problems, right? You yep. got, yeah, right. Basically, Trans has got, like, basically his leg is hanging, hanging on by, like, a tiny little thread right now. He's had, like, a ton of surgery on his knee. And it was Wait, amazing. Beat, uh, Alexander Trans. Oh. Okay. That's why he's not really been in action, because yeah. his knee is really, really like, jacked. Yeah, like, beat, <laughs> mine's also, <laughs> mine's also hanging on by a thread as well. I didn't win King of Max. Though, unfortunately, <laughs> now that um, they can use the prize money, yeah. Yeah, fixed, so, yeah. the, uh, the criteria is you have to have one world pro, and then it goes down to win a grand slam. And then from there, if there's still any open spots, they fill in someone that they think is, is 
good for the job, right? Yeah, you hit the podium at a, uh, a World Pro or a Grand Slam, and you kind of you. But it's, it's all the names you want to see in there, you know. It's 100%. a hundred percent. Let's start. Let's these look. ones so, they've announced so far. You've got. Uh, I think we're gonna go. I think there's gonna be ten in total. I mm -hmm. think we're still announcing a couple, but we've got some big names so far. So there's guys like Herbert Santos, Oof. Adam Wodzinski, Tanner Rice, Gerard Lubinsky. Jared Lubinsky is a little bit of a dark horse, not that well known on the international scene. Just to let people know, he's a, uh, a black belt. He's from Poland, as you can probably tell, Lubinsky, but living in Brazil for the last couple of years, a black belt under Leandro Lowe. Now, we've seen him in action, right? right? The Rio Grand Slam. Guy's a freaking monster. Gigantic. Gigantic. <laughs> oh, man. it's huge. And he's, he's athletic. Yeah, he yeah. looks like a jacked Nicholas Marigali. He looks <laughs> yeah. like if Marigali was like. Ouch. Too Ouch, fifty. Nicholas Marigali. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like if you took a bicycle pump and just like did that to Nicholas Marigali and it was shh and he got it like it was inflated that's what Jared Levinsky is like and he man he took us by surprise because he's a relatively new black belt as well he, he beat got his. Igor Silva in the final right the guy who, who's won everything last year in the UAE number one ranked black belt and that was Past his guard. I think only yeah. lost maybe in the season so, so he's training down at uh, NS Brotherhood right yeah so we met him there right he's got a tough room oh, is that where you guys Igor's, met him at, yeah. at training with Leandro there yeah super nice guy very smart and uh, and he, he he was scheduled to compete at the World Pro and in the King of Mats um, you know the one just passed, and he didn't make it because he actually was in a car driving to the airport, the airport to catch his flight, and they got stuck up on the highway. Basically, a guy in a motorbike pulled up alongside the car, armed, robbed them of everything, took the backpack with all his passport and his plane tickets in and everything, and he missed the flight and he couldn't go. Oh man, yeah, brutal. That's Welcome to Brazil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brazil. Jeez. Jeez. Mm. Anyway, was that so one? that's your first four, oh, okay. <laughs> and then you got another four, Jackson Souza. Man, what, what we could say about Jackson? No introduction Jackson. necessary. Yeah. yeah, animal. Ricardo Evangelista of GF Team, the big man. Ooh, he's a, uh, he's a tough, tough guy to, to handle. Yep. Hudson Mateus, which I think is a really intriguing one. Middle heavyweights and one of the smaller guys in that division right there. But by all accounts, his grips are like ultra heavyweight. He's got like the meanest grips in the division. And uh, Gabriel Arges. Wow. Another, another smaller guy. Freaking middleweight yeah. world champion, man. That's it. Who knows? We haven't seen Gabriel in a couple months, so maybe he's packing His on Instagram pounds? seems like he's been getting jacked lately. Is yes. he? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Still, he's going to be going up against guys like Evangelista, who's like 100, <laughs> yeah. 115 yeah. kilos or something. Yeah, like but Arges is so technical, man. That, you know, yeah. I, I have no doubt that he's going to do really well. Man, you know who I'm excited to see, though? I'm, I'm most excited to see which Herbert Santos uh, of course. shows up. It's always you know, the question, that, right? So, so at, at World Pro, the old Herbert Santos showed up, who was just <laughs> flipping people. people around and on fire. So Diving hopefully. on submissions, yeah. We'll see, yeah. Man, that is a good question, because you never really I mean, know We haven't him, seen him right? in a little while, right? Yeah. I mean, I forget when the last... I he guess wasn't World at Pro Worlds, was last, so... It was the last time we saw him. Yeah, that's true. World he's Pro? Done, he's done some IBJJFs yeah, done some in Brazil, but he hasn't traveled for a while, no. Okay. He skipped out on Worlds, which is a shame. But, um, yeah, really interesting. Also line, interesting line to see up, what his so. haircut looks like. This time, he's always switching that up as well. <laughs> if so. I could recommend the bleached hair again, or bleached goatee. The bleached mm -hmm. goatee. That, that, that was, was awesome. That was an all-timer, for you, sure. Are you, for are sure. you picking uh, Herberth? Is that your... To win it? Yeah. I don't know. I want to see I want to see the other two names that are, that are going to come in. Um, I don't know what they are, but I, I do hope... Um, I was kind of hoping that Nicholas Marigali would get in Ooh, there. I don't, I don't know if he's just... But, but I, I'm always holding out for Nicholas Marigali because I just... Mm, that, that's nice. fun. He's a world pro champion as a purple belt. And brown and belt. brown belt. Double, double yeah. gold at brown belt. That's correct, or, yeah. yeah. He, sure he compete, no, it is, is true because he, he beat Hudson in the absolute final. That's right, okay. And uh, that was the last year that yeah, world pro they... still had absolute division. Yeah. And this one's for 20 grand, is that right? Ooh, uh, you put me on the spot there. I think it is, yeah. 20 grand for the winner, I think. King of Mats. It's a pretty, oh, that's, it's a pretty that's, chunky that's a nice prize pot. The UAE JJF yeah. always has the best prizes. Um, yeah. And the rankings race is, of course, in full effect in the, the Grand Slam, at least, yeah. not the King of Mats. So their season's just starting to really heat up. It'll be the second Grand Slam of the season. Right. There's a lot of good names in for Grand Slam already. We've got, uh, we've got guys like, we, you know, some of the guys will be competing in the King of Mats, but then we also got guys like Lucas Hulk. Uh, yeah, Kennedy Massiel. I'm excited to see him. Oh, you, you, you! I took it. Oh, oh, I took it. Oh. I was building up to that. <laughs> I was gonna say Marcio Andre is in that. I just ah. long range, long yeah. range. Yeah. It's all stored right here. Oh, you know who else? Robert. You've been waiting to. You you're excited? That's why, right? I am. Roberto Jimenez. <laughs> Roberto, <laughs> Roberto Jimenez is coming. A brown belt. As a brown belt. belt. Oh, okay, and I want to. Talos right. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Who's in, <laughs> who's in Roberto's division? Oh, we've got. Uh, so this is Jonatus. Jonatus. Jonatus Gracie and Roberto. 
Ronaldo, sorry, Ronaldo Jr. Ronaldo Jr., the two autos. Brown oh, man, those matches wow. would be insane. Those so matches are going to be crazy. At, like, I did say, right, that Roberto's face is probably up on the Atos wall. Yeah, yeah. Wanted yeah, poster. I don't think right. Roberto's done himself any favors at the, the Atos HQ there, I feel like right? in a video game, he just went to the next level of bosses, and he's facing, like, the next scary guys. <laughs> yeah. I think he's going to do well, though. The kid's oh, on yeah, fire. Yeah, so. for sure. So, uh, oh, a wait, lot. Can I come and do the conversation? Just because I see this yeah. this thing right here. And we did mention Ryan Hall. And I did see this morning that Ryan Hall was booked to fight BJ Penn. Did you guys see that? Oh, that's I awesome. did hear that. Did see that. It's official, December 29th. What do you guys think about that that match? I mean, what what do you think? What are they? I it's kind of crazy. Because and... BJ, man, is... I, I love BJ, but man, I can't say he's looked great the last couple of fights. Last four or five but fights BJ's that he's had. 39, man. 39. I kind of think that But how old is be... Ryan Hall, though? That's true. I mean, like, 90. early to mid... <laughs> early 30s, I would Early guess, 30s, and he I doesn't have imagine. the experience that... Uh, BJ or Penn the wear, has. wear and tear on his body, probably. That's exactly. true. Exactly. You know, BJ Penn has been fighting MMA since he was like, what, 20 years old? Legend. Right? It, is, it literally is a legend. Oh, I mean, sure. Ryan Hall's 33, but that's a, you know, MMA years like dog years, right? So <laughs> BJ Penn's been fighting professionally for like 18, 19 years. That's a long time. And if I recall, um, Ryan Hall really, his success was the leg lock game. In, yeah. You know, when he was in the fighter house in the and all that, fighter, right? He submitted a bunch of guys with the leg lock, yeah. So I'd be curious if he's going to pull that out against uh, BJ and if he's got an answer for the leg and lock. And I don't know if you guys have seen the Gray Maynard Ryan Hall fight. Yeah, yeah, But definitely. that is an incredible fight for when grappler. Ryan basically spams him in Ari rolls. Yes, yeah. but it's I'm so real. fun and to like watch. And like spin kicks, right? He was doing a bunch of weird yeah, spin kicks. Yeah, he was and connecting yeah. with the kicks. Yeah. He, he came out of it without like a scratch in his face, man. And Gray Maynard was so mad at him because like he thought he was like kind of running from the fight. But like I feel like if you're a grappler and you watch that fight like it just like sings the success of grappling you know nice. um, BJ's got some really good jujitsu though you know we were talking about course, Ryan Hall as like a representative the OG of American first American to win black belt worlds man that's that's insane statistic right there and he was like 19 when he did that you know the guy who literally his nickname was the prodigy right oh, yeah. so I want to see what his jiu-jitsu is like up against a guy like Ryan Hall. Because it's a, a, you know, we're talking about clash of styles, sure, right? Sure, sure. Ryan Hall and his very leggy kind of entanglements, kind of leg lock style game. A great triangle as well. He's got those long skinny legs. What's BJ going to I mean, be I like? think Ryan Hall's striking strategy couldn't be quite the same because BJ would be happy to engage on the ground, I believe. Mm. So he might have to watch himself a bit more. It's interesting because I'm not sure when the last time really we saw BJ engage somebody on the ground. He's really become much yeah, of a striker a for, uh, the last couple fights. And he's and then fought it's been boxer his, wrestlers. Yeah, you yeah. know, right? And Guys who have been standing. With in him. my opinion, it's been his his gas, his cardio that's really kind of like failed him in those fights. So it would be interesting to see if he does get on the ground. Shout out to uh, James Lawson for uh, yeah, yeah. for mentioning that. Also. He also said, don't forget Brian Ortega That's as true. a grappler, as a jiu-jitsu guy in MMA. Uh, very good very point. Very good right? point. Yeah, yeah, he would be an yeah. amazing addition to ADCC. Right. He would be an amazing Ooh. addition. And what, what did we like think? Does he fight a featherweight, right? Featherweight, 145, yeah. So he could do 66 or even 77 or, at ADCC. Or Charles, Charles Oliveira. He's another Brazilian guy who's got really good jiu-jitsu in Charles the Charles De Bronx. De Bronx, <laughs> yeah. I would love to see him. Um, who's that? Who's the Russian guy? Who does the Nogi Ezekiel chokes? I want to. I oh I yeah, see that yeah, guy. from bottom, from bottom mount. Yeah, from yeah, yeah. bottom, right? I want to <laughs> see that guy do ADCC. Speaking of Russian guys and submissions, man, we have to give a quick shout out oh, to that yeah, crazy Niba, Zavitz Niba. The, the, the stretch. Light, lightning strikes twice in the same event. Mm. You saw two of the same Nibas, right, from the back control, and uh, one of them was was Zavit. I'm not even going to try yeah, and pronounce his surname. Something Gamenov. <laughs> yeah. And the other and one, what was emotional. the guy's name? Sterling. Uh, Alger, Algermain Sterling. There you go. Yeah. 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 Crazy move. Man. That is a brutal one, right? Yeah. I think I've been in there a couple times, but I've tapped way earlier. Way <laughs> earlier. Someone put you in one of those? I, well, so even something like, like shaking, you know, shaking somebody off from the back and they just like grab my leg. Mm. And I was like, no way. That's crazy. So, mm. uh, shout out to Sean Williams. I think he just put out a breakdown on his uh, Facebook account on how to Honestly, do that. Yeah, so check yeah. that out. Yeah, you guys he's a, um, or uh, Algernon Sterling's, I believe, a. Uh, uh, I guess I don't know for a fact. But I know he trains under um, Matt Serra. I don't know if he's a black belt, oh, though. Oh, nice. And isn't Zabit training with Henzo School as well? Ricardo Almeida. Oh, there you go. Yep. Wow. So both both Henzo affiliates there, both Henzo guys, kind of. That's interesting. That Se is cool. Secret move. So um, lots going on there in the international scene at the moment. We've got some uh, got some stuff to get excited about over the next couple of weeks. But um, man, there, there was a, a, a big conversation topic. We we teased it earlier. We <laughs> oh, yeah. mentioned it briefly. Right? <laughs> Let's just find our way back to that a second because. <laughs> Um, 
we had the UWW Grappling World Championships in Kazakhstan and uh, take place on September uh, 5th through 9th, uh, or 6th through 9th, I should say. And um, the big news was that, you know, this is a, a country versus country style where you get like guys from, from Russia, Azerbaijan, Philippines, Spain, Poland, all these different nationalities coming together. And there aren't that many well-known competitors at these events, right? So the, the level of talent at these events, it's, it's pretty good from certain countries, but these aren't a lot of big recognizable names. But there were two names that stood out because the Brazil squad... For the first time in years, Brazil actually sent some representatives and they sent the Miao brothers. So Joao and Paulo both went to represent Brazil at the UWW Grappling World Championships. Which sounded great, right? Mm. But unfortunately, it kind of unraveled. Who wants to who wants to tackle that? Yeah, no, quick? we were definitely super excited to um to see them and we were excited all week talking about it and, and you know checking the what divisions they were going to be in and everything like that. So we were super excited to see both Paulo and Joao go out there. The problem is, is that it's a uh, WADA-affiliated event. And so I have to be very careful my language here because it's a, it's a technical thing, but uh, Paulo was still under suspension from his previous doping violation at the 2016 World IBJJF Championships. World Championships. Yeah, so and just to explain for people, because a lot of people understand that Paolo was, you know, he, he had a doping incident, and it relates to the World Championships 2016 when he won gold, and then he was later stripped. Now, this didn't come out until, uh, I, I believe, like m April, May in 2017, because the kind of the investigation process, the arbitration process, the appeals process, everything that kind of gets done behind closed doors, and then when they make their final judgment... That came out a long time after the championships have to hap uh, have actually happened. So, Paolo, uh, he popped for clomiphene, which is um, a banned substance under the WADA uh, code. And um, he got a two-year suspension. But then it's not two years necessarily from exactly when you competed and when the test happened. The suspension was through until September 29th of this year. Hmm. So just so, a few weeks yeah. away. Literally, away. three weeks yeah. out. Three weeks from the end of his two-year suspension, he went to compete at the UWW World Grappling Championships. In, in, in that, basically, two-year time, he hasn't really competed too much anywhere. You know, I mean, he did the... Done a few. He did the... Here and there. Some submission su super fights and... Submission uh, ADCC. ADCC. Basically, you know, non-regulated events. Yeah. Well, there aren't that many. Just there are only a handful. IBJJF and... UWW are pretty much the only two WADA signatory mm -hmm. events in grappling or jiu-jitsu. So he went to compete in Abu Dhabi World Pro and stuff. They aren't necessarily bound to I want to say suspension. no, he, could, he didn't do World Pro, he did the Grand Slams. No, he did World he did Pro. Did World he didn't do Grand yeah. Slam, yeah. Oh, Makes yeah, you okay. wonder how he, how he even signed up for this competition. Like, he's not a name that you just gloss over and say, oh, who is this guy? Like, yeah, like, like well you said, known. there's, there's not the many names in there. There's probably literally two names that jumped out at us in the all registration, and they were Joao and Paolo Miao, you know? Yeah. It's not like it was a secret that they, that they were doing this. To me, it seems like a, a, a bit of a, fi I don't want to be too critical here, but maybe a, a letdown or a failure from UWW by allowing him to compete, by even allowing him to register. Um, well, the process obviously failed everybody involved, right? Because Paolo has held his hand up and he said, I didn't realize that my suspe suspension was valid in this event. Like, because I he's competed in other events with no issue. He understood that he was banned from IBJJF, but he thought that, well, he says you know, in his statement to us, that um, he believed that his punishment was only valid for IBJJF tournaments. So you have to think that if he goes to IBJJF and he tries to sign up, he just can't. They just don't accept his registration. Now, if you're on a banned list, you know, an international banned list from USADA stroke WADA, then UWW shouldn't have even accepted his registration, mm. right? But that then there's the question of the p people who recruited him for the Brazil team, who sent him to Kazakhstan. Mm. They are, you're going to represent Brazil. Did one of them look into the fact that he might still be suspended? Did anybody ask? I mean, I doubt he will, found that event under his own volition. I mean, I don't think anyone's dying to, yeah. to go over no, there. He was invited. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, then, and then he actually had he had a fight. He had a match. He had, he he had, had a match. match. He won then, the match. And then what, at submission. that point, they said, oh, wait, we can't have this guy here? Is that really what happened? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, he they allowed him to step onto the mat and to compete. So this opens up a real issue now because... If he'd just gone and if he tried to compete and they'd said, whoa, hang on a second, you're in Kazakhstan, but you better not go on that mat because you're in a suspension. 
fine. But because he has now competed in that two-year suspension period, the rule book, if it's followed to the letter, he could potentially receive another two-year suspension as a result. Which would be an absolute travesty. It would I be think. such a travesty. It really would be. Yeah, that's that's so unfortunate that after all that, after the entire you know two years, and then you know just for, it seemed like something fell man. fell through the, the cracks there. You know, and, and yeah. I honestly think they, that Usada deserves some of the blame right. too as well for not being so. Um, black and white in, in, in what things what well, he mean, can and can't do you know what? I feel like their aim is, is to protect other athletes and in this case no one is really protected and they might just punish someone for really what might be an honest mistake so yeah it's a really unfortunate situation all around um, and the rule book itself as well I mean again we're talking about following the letter of the law here but Paolo could potentially face an extra two years on his suspension right Joao the team managers, even the personnel from the event could all potentially be cited and sanctioned as well because the rule book actually has that any athletes, team managers, coaches, wow. and so on, if you enable a suspended athlete to compete in an event, you're potentially held liable for sanction as well. That's no, from UW, I mean, that's from UWW? That's the USADA. 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 No, is UWW that... could, could actually be fined. For allowing them to compete, because no, they, really. they allowed it to so happen. You say so you say the the, te the teammates or the coaches, or the so would that be f just for this particular event? Like they're not allowed to go to UWW events, or could it would that... be any water signatory oh, event. Oh man, so, that's you a know, huge blow. It would. I mean, you could, be, you could potentially you could potentially be looking at guys from Paolo's team because they helped train with him. Uh, being banned from IPJJF. Well, that's ludicrous. You saw so, means business, right? Hopefully man. that doesn't happen. But. I mean, they do mean business. And you have to think, okay, these rules are in place for a reason. The yeah. idea is to deter this from taking place in the, in, the, in the first place, right? Which is kind of the ideal situation. But once it's happened, I mean, jiu-jitsu is not, let's say, high-level cycling. We're not looking at a Lance Armstrong style, systemic kind of, you know, huge machine enabling one person to go out and to gain the system and so on. You know, guy got caught, popped, okay, boom. You know, are you really going to punish all his coaches and his One of, like, the only combat um, athletes in, like, the history of, this, of any of these sports to, like, actually take ownership of, of the... Um, That's true. The popped That's right. test, you know? He's, like, one of the only guys who said... And the you know, fact that it yeah. was like two weeks away is just like yeah, that's so just a killer right there. Brutal it is bad news. So really interesting to see what's going to happen. I mean, that's a developing you know story right there, and we'll make sure to so update it took, as it took we months. learn more. It took almost a full year for the the release of like his punishment from his original violation. Yep. How long is this going to take, and can he compete after his ban is up? Very good question. You know, they still haven't um, they still haven't issued a um, amount of time ban for John Jones. Wow. And that was like interesting. And that was like fourteen months ago. That was like last summer. Right? What happened after his hearing? Was that last summer? Like the hearing that they had? Yeah, they they never they never like. This um, is one of the issues gave, I have. Gave him a punishment. This is one of the issues I have suspended. with this, you know, like process. Is that it's, it's so shadowy, mm -hmm. right? There's there's like um you you hear in the, especially in MMA when a guy tests positive, you almost hear about the results of the test before any decision has been made. Whereas like in other sports. Like, I get the, the press releases from USADA, and, you know, um, I'll get the news that this weightlifter has tested positive to something relating to 2015. Or, you know, this grappler, or this, yeah. this wrestler yeah. tested positive for something, uh, you know, six months ago. Or it's, there's just no rhyme or reason to mm. it. And I guess a lot of that is because they don't want to actually announce it until it's 100% this yeah. is what we're going to do. But it doesn't make it any easier for these athletes because they're left in limbo. And as we know, athletic careers are finite, and they're short, and this is prime time for somebody like Paolo in his late 20s. He should be out there as active as possible, right? Yeah, I think, you know, we're all for a clean sport, and we're all for, you know, testing done the right way and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it just seems like some, some things have fallen through the cracks. So where do, we, where do we have to keep an eye out? Is it the USADA website? Are they the ones who would come out with a statement about I mean, eventually, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, we're just going to have to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do our due diligence as investigative journalists to try and find out what the story is here. And uh, we'll update as, as you know. We they don't find share a lot of information, out, though. I mean, it yeah. might be a while before yeah. we hear anything. That's the truth. It's yeah. too bad. We so. could have seen him at, uh, at maybe we still still will, Nogi Worlds, right? And then just right into the 2019 season. Well, so when does this? Uh, um, September 29th. 29th. So do you think maybe we'll hear something then? Actually, I just remembered his, his suspension 
uh, was dated from September because even though he tested positive at the World Championships, which takes place in June, 20, or took place in June 2016, mm. he competed at an IBJJF event in September 2016. So that's why uh, it started I was September. wondering. I, I thought yeah. it was always retroactive from the date you popped, but... It was okay. from his, the last time that he had competed in, in gotcha, under those rules. Gotcha, that makes so, more sense. Yeah, yeah. So if he were to maybe compete in future IBJJF events, they might not hand down a suspension for months and then take it from his last time. So let's say if he didn't hear, you know, any enters in PANS 2019 and they tell him in May, oh, you're suspended, that might start from PANS is what I'm understanding from right, that, right. which is completely messed up. So if I was Paolo, I wouldn't sign up for any IBJJF events for a while. Not <laughs> until, until you get things sorted. Until you hear yeah, exactly. But uh, okay. yeah, that's brutal. So, developing story. But uh, one of the developing story, we just got some really cool news actually, didn't we? That a super fight has been signed for October. Fight to Win Pro, or sorry, just Fight to Win, as they are called now. Mm. Sorry, changed the name. Uh, just signed a really, really cool submission only uh, headlining match in Miami, Florida. So this is Fight to Win 89 on October 12th. Wagner Hocha versus. Augusto Tanquinho Mendes. Fantastic. That's match. a hell of a match. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice, right? No gi submission only super fights. What do you think? I mean, two of the best guys at, what are they, 66 kilograms? Um, active well, Ro right Rocha's 77. Because so, uh, we got uh, Tanquinho. Okay, okay, okay. Tanquinho is ranked number two at 66, and Rocha is, uh, is number four at 77. So they'll so, meet in the middle then. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they're both super. Super talented guys, but I believe this is a 175, uh, no, 170 pound match. Wagner, he'll be in his hometown, right? He's from from Miami, so he'll be in front of his his crowd, his own crowd. The fight sports crowd will be out in force for yeah, sure. Yeah, those oh, guys, yeah. those They're guys big family. come in numbers yeah. when, they, when one of theirs is uh, on the stage. And he's just, man, we just saw him at Kasai. He is such a crazy guy. He's such a crazy <laughs> guy. He's no, 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 I'm not playing that. this game with you. <laughs> <laughs> you feel, you, you feel. Me, you me feel me. You. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, be careful when you shake Wagner's hand. Yeah. Right? Don't don't lock fingers with that dude. <laughs> so I'm, I, you know, he's gonna come out with all those antics, you know, because Tanquino is more of like he's just a kind of by the book type of a guy, you know. Puts yeah, his... but he's a bulldog though, man. I mean, Tanquino is one of the best nogi guys in the world. You know, he's uh, he's smaller. He's gonna have a little bit of a weight disadvantage, but you have to think that Wagner's tactics. Um, well, actually, number two things. Number one, I think Wagner maybe respects Tanquinho a little bit more mm. that he would come out. He wouldn't necessarily start clubbing him and slapping him like we've seen. I don't you know. know. He likes to do that to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. But number two, I don't think he'd phase Tanquinho as much as some of these guys. MMA. He's fun exactly. Yeah. Tanquinho's yeah. been doing MMA. Cowboy. He's a pro. He kind of gets it. He had right? a great match at the 2016 Nogi Worlds with Yuri Samoyes. Like it was a close match. Are you serious? So wow. yeah, absolutely. Two hundred and twenty pound Yuri Smoyes. Yeah, so yeah, I don't think yeah. I don't think he'll be daunted by by Wagner, but it will be fun. I think it'll be very scrappy. Um, definitely hard to call at this point. Man, yeah. Vag Va Kasai Wagner showed everything. He's got the heel hooks. He's a good wrestler. He he's plays the mind game. You yeah. know, he he can go deep into a tournament. And he's a veteran of fight to win. I mean, as, as is T Tankino, but I think Wagner's appeared more. Yeah, I remember Tankinho won the title because he's—I he, believe he's the title holder, right? It's a title match. It's a, it's for it. Well, Tankinho had the title, oh, and then uh, he relinquished the title because of contractual gotcha. issues. Gotcha. He went off, and but now these guys—they're actually fighting for the vacant uh, welterweight title, which was Gary Tonans. Ah. Okay. So Gary's now focusing on MMA, right? So he's stepped away from the grappling scene. Mm. And uh, but the word is, and this is a direct quote from Seth Daniels, CEO of Fight to Win that Gary can come back and challenge the winner if and when he's available. Anytime he wants. I like that. Yeah, I think Gary would totally be game. Gary, Gary, oh, Gary yeah. sees someone else walking around with his belt, he'll, he'll be on the mat in no Gary. time. Happy belated birthday to Gary Tony. Oh, Tonin. shout out Gary Tony. Shout out Gary so, Tony. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Wagner's, uh, we, we talked about how he is, you know, notoriously chippy and stuff in his matches, and uh, you definitely don't want to wanna give that guy any, uh, any, any room to start, you know, mm. Because, man, he can take it into deep waters, right? Yeah, and he's got all those crazy chokes, too, right? He's got, like, I don't, I don't know what this is. They call one? it the muffler. Yeah, and this and this one, this, and he chokes people like this, too, like that. Those are crazy. It is. But Wagner made his name is uh, especially over the last couple of years in the combat jiu-jitsu arena, right? Mm. Probably the guy that you associate most with that style, right? The, Certainly. The open hand slaps jiu-jitsu kind of thing. Mm. I, I feel like he's like begging people yeah. to, to fight him in combat jiu-jitsu, you know? He's like, please, let's do a combat <laughs> jiu-jitsu match. His last match, man, I don't know if you guys saw that, but that was, that was tough to watch. He was just like, he had this guy XFN21 against Alex Murray. Right, that yeah. was on uh, yeah. Flow Combat. If you yeah. didn't see it, he actually at one point 
hold his opponent's shirt, rash guard up to slap their belly and get, <laughs> oh, get it. Give him, give him a raspberry. <laughs> a little some more sting yeah. to it. Man. Fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. It's jiu-jitsu. It's great. I mean, we joked about it. We said that, you know, Wagner is a nasty man. And he's not. He's a lovely guy. He's a great guy. Except in a match. No, oh, yeah. That, oh, somebody said, I forget where I saw it. Or when he said it, it was like a um, Wagner Rocha, the nicest guy on or just off the mats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever yeah. Just off the mats. You yeah. will, I mean, Chase right here, you rolled with Wagner, right? He was, well, yeah, yeah, he was super cool. We is at ADCC, and of course, uh, I wasn't going to challenge Wagner at all. <laughs> He was just, he was about to compete. I didn't want to, you know, damage him at all. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. Uh, he was able to <laughs> flow and, and have, a, have a good time. He was laughing. You know, you can tell he just loves jujitsu. But then he just, he knows how to turn it on. I don't think there's anything personal behind it. I don't think he's even angry. In fact, he's smiling the whole time, which is terrifying. But uh, he just knows how to. How old to... is Wagner? Does anybody know? 36? Mm. He's 36. I want to say, approximately, yeah. And he's not a, and he's, he's not a kid. He's still around. Yeah, but he doesn't look at all like he's. You know, slow down he's a beat. Looks like he's, he's 36. Time. Man, he's an insane shape. Mow down people he in the round in... robin event. No problem at Kasai. Yeah. He's got a gas yeah. tank that doesn't stop. And I remember it was Jake McKenzie. So um, Jake McKenzie is one of Canada's top exports, right? Amazing black belt mm -hmm. from Nova Scotia. But he's been traveling in the world for years. Um, and he's most associated with GF Team, right? Everybody knows Jake represents GF Team when he competes. But Jake trained for a very long time at fight sports with Cyborg, mm -hmm. right? And now, know that. way back in the day, and apparently Wagner wasn't full-time martial artist back then either. Like, he used to work on, like, construction sites and stuff. <sighs> and he'd come in, you know, kind of, like, all dusty and stuff from, like, you know, hauling a wheelbarrow around or a bunch of bricks or whatever. And, and, <laughs> and you know, he'd come in, wash his hands, kick everybody's ass, and then he'd be like, all right, guys, see you tomorrow. <laughs> and then go back and go work on construction site again. It's just one of those guys. That explains one the you. hands and the wrist locks. Just uh, yeah. Really does, yeah. Mm. And that's in October, right? Uh, yeah, October. Man, it does not uh, stop with it flow grappling. It, it does huh? not stop. Jeez. It doesn't. So, uh, How much would they have to pay you to do a, a combat jiu-jitsu match with Wagner? <laughs> with Wagner, at least... Eight thousand dollars. Whoa! All eight right. to show. You'll do for eight, eight to show. <laughs> show eight. money. Eight. Show money. <laughs> with with uh, a matching win money, I think eight thousand. Eight, 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 eight to show. One hundred thousand to win. <laughs> <laughs> I earn every penny if I if I take oh, that. Man. Good luck with that. Jesus. I got right. hands stone too, man. I'm gonna start picking up bricks today. <laughs> <laughs> Man, been a lot of fun. I finally have the full crew back. Oh, yeah. You know, full attendance back in the studio for uh, Fistful of Collars. Have to do this again sometime. Maybe, I, maybe I, even I, next week. We'll maybe, maybe even next week. Yeah, maybe. We'll fun. see. I'd we'll like see. that. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you again for the next one.